Seth Godin, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. And you've been doing this a while. It's generous work. Thank you for showing up the way you do. No, I appreciate it. Seth, for the listeners who may not be familiar with you and your work, who are you and what do you do? Um, well, I'm a teacher and I've written 20 bestsellers. I invented one of the first internet companies, started some other projects, but mostly what I do is I try to notice things and talk about them. Awesome. Seth, uh, I want to get into your uh, your work. Uh, your work it, it definitely impacted my journey, my professional life, my personal life. You're definitely the reason why I am podcasting here. I took your course back during COVID. I want to talk about some of your books. But before we do that, just want to touch, so I want to start back all the way from the beginning. Where did you grow up? I was born in New York, but I grew up in Mount Vernon, which is about 11 miles from New York City. Seth, I find like 10 to 12 years old, like very formative in people's lives. And I also find the dinner table really, really just a microcosm of their life at that moment. If you think back to like 10, 12 years old, who was at the dinner table? Could you describe the scene? What was going on? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, another interviewer who I really admire likes to talk about what was family dinner like for you? Uh, family dinner for me, has always been special. It's special when uh, I was raised in the family and it's special growing up. Um, my mom worked at the museum in Buffalo. My dad uh, worked at a big company, but there was always conversation. My two sisters and I were always on the spot talking about things that were interesting. People talked to us like we were adults. And the idea that Family dinner is a real thing. It's so important. And for so many families around the world, it's a luxury and it shouldn't be. Uh, that idea that you have enough and that there are people who care about you and you can take time to sit at a table with them every evening, that's part of being human. Absolutely. Growing up, my, myself, uh, my grandparents came from Italy and uh, Sunday dinners are so big in the Italian culture. And uh, just thinking back, you say my childhood, uh, my, 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 I was lucky like you, I had two amazing parents. But when you say think of your childhood, I think of the Sunday dinners around my grandmom's table when my whole extended family was there. Really cool. How about thinking back uh, with your two sisters, mom and dad, like if you think back during that time before college, what's the most powerful memory of your childhood? Um, so as I warned you, I'm really averse to when somebody who has built anything shows up and talks about the magic of their upbringing, because what it does is it lets everybody else off the hook mm -hmm. that if we're listening to someone talk about the trauma of their upbringing, we can say, well, I didn't have trauma. And if we're listening to someone who didn't have trauma, but had lots of support, we can say, well, I didn't have that. And I've studied a lot of successful people. And what I can tell you is the only thing they have in common is they don't have very much in common. Yeah. And we have to be very careful not to ask, what did you have for breakfast today? Because what you had for breakfast today is not why you are successful. And so I give my sisters and my parents so much credit and gratitude, but they're not going to be your sisters and they're not going to be your parents. Uh -huh. So I don't think we should worry about it. Fair enough. I think that kind of relates a little bit. You tell a story in a couple of your books of Stephen King gives a talk and at the end, they're like, what pencil do you use? And everybody wants Stephen King's pencil, but they're not going to write like him, even if they have the pencil. Totally understand. Correct. All right. So let's fast forward to 18. If someone asked the 18 year old version of Seth Godin, what he wanted to be when he grew up, what would the 18 year old version of you say? Uh, and most people don't believe me, but it would be that I do what I do now. Awesome. How so? Like, really? Yes. Yeah. And there wasn't even a title for it. You know, there yeah. were people who had a column in Forbes magazine and I was reading my dad's copy and there were people who got to do projects and I knew about them in the world. There were nobody on the internet. There was nobody who could do the startup life the way we can now. But I just knew that my attention span was aligned with what was coming. And there are people who, for many reasons, grew up to need to be a farmer, to do what they did yesterday, to pay careful, close attention day by day. But the world has shifted, mm -hmm. and farming thinking isn't nearly as effective as the reflexes of a hunter who notices the little thing moving in the woods, but is easily bored. Mm -hmm. And um, the internet is maximizing that feeling in a lot of people, and I think we need to 
not let us get us down, but instead put it to good work. Yeah. So let's fast forward here. My introduction to your work was a book I read maybe 15, 20 years ago, Permission Marketing. Okay. And so much was written about that. But basically, if I summarize it one sentence, it's like ads that rely on interrupting people, they're dead. Um, and it's so easy to ignore. Like you see a bus stop, you don't even see the ads at the bus stop anymore. Like you see that you could be Nike, could be flashing in neon. It, it might take me six months to realize that's a Nike sign, right? Yeah. Is that fair? And, and then basically you want, to, you want to give people a chance to volunteer their attention. You, you need to earn their attention to build uh, like a customer base where like if you were gone, you would be missed. Yeah, I mean, think about this podcast, Joe. No, you're not forcing anyone to listen. You don't have listeners because you ran bus ads. No. There are people who are listening right now because they want to. And if this is the last episode, I hope it's not. Some people would get to their podcast reader next week and wonder where you went. Mm -hmm. That is the asset of the future, not the fact that you have money to spam people. Mm -hmm. Understood. That's that, and that just changed the game because if you look at it, there's even in sales. I'm in sales, my profession, and there was a point 20 years ago where you would just show up at the customer's office unannounced. Here I am. I'm here to talk to you. And they're like, get out of here. Almost like a cold call. They're like, get out of here. But then if you did important work for them or invited them into something, some sort of cohort with them, and then they're, they, they're like, where's John? Where's Mary? Where's Nicole? Where's Joe? Like, they want you to show up. Like, where you been? Right? And, and exactly. So fast forward. So I'm a big fan of Tim Ferriss. And I've listened. I, one of the most magic episodes I think he has is the one he had you on. And you speak to, you write Permission Marketing. It was a monster success. But then you, of all people, took a year off not thinking you could ever replicate that magic. All right. Then I understand from what I understand is then Mac Malcolm Gladwell sent you a copy of the tipping point. Then that spurred you writing the idea virus. Can you speak to that? Uh, yeah, you got most of the facts right. You know, the the thing about writing one bestseller is congratulations, that's wonderful. If you try to write a second one, you've now announced that you're an author. And I had been a book packager before that, but I hadn't been seeing myself as an author. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. once I had achieved what I achieved in permission marketing and I had some family things going on, I just needed to sit. And when Malcolm sent me his book, I didn't realize that I'd been spending all that time thinking because after I read The Tipping Point, it took only two weeks to write Unleashing the Idea Virus. I wrote wow. the whole book. I typed it as fast as I could. And that's why I had Malcolm write the foreword because I, A, wanted to thank him for spurring me on, but B, I also wanted his permission just in case I was stealing too many ideas from the tipping point. And I think that what the lesson there is for a lot of people is you think that the creative work has to be really, really hard or based on persistent brilliance. Mm -hmm. And it's not. You simply have something to say. But if you don't sit down and type it, no one's going to get to read it. Yeah. Why do you think that's so scary to sit down and type? I have a blog. I have, maybe I have 200 articles up. And it's sometimes you're so in your head, like you're almost afraid of bad writing. Like, like yeah. you're almost afraid to, to, like when you write something like the, I, I, like it took me 200 blog posts to realize the first like 500 words are garbage I'll never use. And that magic sentence comes the 500, like at the 501 yeah. word, right? And that's the basis and everything else just gets thrown away and no one ever sees it, thank God. Or they would take my computer from me and say, you don't need this anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, when friends ask me for advice and I've helped a lot of people create books that have been bestsellers around the world. I said, look, it's simple. Go out and spend $39 on a USB digital recorder. And then go find somebody who you trust, who trusts you, and go for a walk with them. And over the course of that walk, explain to them what it is you want to say in your book. Just talk to them. You don't have talker's block. Can you explain it to them? Can you, when they get confused, make it more clear? Then take that recording send it to a transcript house. And what they send back is the first draft of your book. Wow. And what is fascinating about this is that half the people who ask for my help never do it. They like being stuck. They like not having a book. Mm -hmm. But the other people who do it, after 10 minutes with the recorder, they're off to the races. Now they know what to do because yeah. they got over the hump. 
Because once you have that first draft, you have something to edit, to tweak, to Every add, to draft. delete, right? And it, you have something there that it, it like the hard parts are not the hard part, but like the the, the initial hard part is over. And that, no, that's, yeah. there's exactly. a recorder being built, being bought. But let's fast forward a little bit to the linchpin, which is a book that just changed the way I looked at my professional life. Just to summarize it real quick, maybe just simply following direction. Those days are over. We need to make ourselves indispensable. And it's transferring your passion into your job. What am I missing there? Put your heart into your work. No, I don't think you're. I don't think you're missing very much. I think that there's a big difference between a chef and a cook. Okay, How and so? even more than a bottle washer, right? So the bottle washer is simply following the regime, and if the stuff's pretty clean, then they're off the shift. Mm -hmm. The cook, the cook is given recipes, and their job is to execute them as fast as possible. Mm -hmm and replicate them over and over again. The chef, if you're a great chef, you have to invent something. The chef doesn't have to own the restaurant, but the chef has to have a reputation. Cooks don't need a reputation. A chef needs a reputation. And so what I argued in that book, and it was, I don't know, 15 years ago, the internet was going to make it really easy to show people what your reputation was. Show me your body of work. Show me what you've done. Show me what other people have said about you. If you don't have that body of work to point to, if you just say, all I am is good at following instructions, we're going to follow, find someone cheaper than you to follow instructions. And now, as you and I are talking, GPT-3 is all the rage. It's possible for an AI to write a mediocre blog post or a, re a mediocre podcast introduction in less than three seconds for free. So if all you're doing is mediocre work, don't bother. Mm -hmm. I guess that goes into where we talk about hack, right? So after you write Linchpin, that, that book... You had to be tremendously proud of that book. Did you ever get that feeling like maybe someone who wrote that one number one hit and, and like had you fear writing the next one after Lynchpin? Like what goes through your mind after you wrote that? Um, I knew that it was unlikely I was ever going to write another book like Lynchpin when I finished it because the person who wrote that book had enough elasticity and focus and passion to push their way through it. And that's okay. I've accepted the fact that other books are going to have a different thing to them. But as someone who's been pushed his whole career to be like a real author who writes real books, that's a real book by a real author. Yeah, that's that, but incredible. Really good. So moving on to the book, I think the book that I kind of refer to the most, and if, if someone listened to 75 episodes of the podcast, this is the book I bring up the most, The Dip. Because it's just like, you taught me, I think one thing you said, what does Seth Godin teach you? One, the process, show up every day, give your hour. But also two, would, one B would be winners quit all the time. Uh, they just quit the wrong thing so they can focus on the right things. And you teach, I think, the fallacy of sunk costs in there. You have to ignore the sunk costs, which that was not in my brain, neither of them before I read that. Could you speak to that or fill in the gaps? Well, the good news is the book's only 96 pages long. So I'm hoping that people will actually read it because I made it as short as I possibly could. But I will tell you that we live in a society that celebrates and lionizes people who stick it out. And that's crazy because the most successful people are the ones who quit, right? Bill Clinton quit playing the saxophone. He didn't have a jazz band. He decided he'd rather be president. <laughs> that you know someone who took ballet lessons when they were four, they don't still walk around in a tutu because the fact is that you it wouldn't have made their life better to keep doing ballet. Well, that's true for your startup, or half the people on your prospect list if you're a salesperson. So if you can figure out who you can serve the best and get rid of everybody else, your life gets better. And I'll tell you a story. I don't know if it's in the book. One of the big financial services company did an analysis and they found that 10% of their customers were calling them so much they were 90% of their customer service. And it also turned out that the same 10% of their customers had low balances. So they were losing money on all of them. And they were keeping them from being really useful to everybody else. So they wrote a really nice letter to the 10% of their customers. And they said, we're not doing a good job of serving you. Here is the phone number of our competitors. We hope you will switch because they're eager to help you. 
And by walking away from people they couldn't do a good job with, they could focus on the people they could do a good job with. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're also not willing to do a good job. That's great. You want to get rid of almost your bad customers and say they're bad people, just they're not a good fit for your company and move on and focus on right. who you can serve best. Move on. This book here is, I think, just magic. This one here, love what to do. Uh, what to do when it's your turn. I think out of this book, what I learned, and I think a lesson to pass on is don't wait to be picked. Choose yourself. And then also another thing I got out of it too is you can't make the fear go away. You know, we just have to learn how to dance with it, right? right. You can fill in the gaps. So I just think it's so powerful because you're so used to, I've worked for big corporations most of my life and it's so much you wicked picked. Who's the next person they pick? Who they select? And Mary and John have the same type of uh, skill set, but they like Mary or they like John. And, and it's just that subjective thing. One gets picked the other, but you just go, you just choose yourself and move forward with your project, your blog, your writing, your YouTube channel. You move forward, but then you got that thing, the fear. You got that fear in the pit of your stomach. And maybe we could speak fear a little bit. Like, where do you think that fear comes from? Where like, they're going to make fun of you. They're going to... People are going to laugh. More likely, they're just going to ignore you. But like, you feel like, oh right. my gosh, they're going to make fun. It's going to be they're going to ignore you than anything. But it's uh, where do you think that fear comes from? Well, the name of it is resistance, and it comes from my friend Steve Pressfield. Resistance is an evolutionary win, and the reason is, if we evolved as humans to be in villages of a hundred people, which we did, mm -hmm. if you're in the village of a hundred and you offend the chief they're going to kick you out of the village tonight and a saber tooth tiger is going to eat you for breakfast. And so you didn't have a great opportunity to have grandchildren. If you were the kind of person that spoke up when you weren't supposed to, that said, here's a good idea that went against the chief of the moment. And so we indoctrinated people from a very early age. Will this be on the test? Please don't speak unless you're spoken to. You get the idea. Yeah. And yeah. So that's deep within us. And we come up with all sorts of clever ways to evidence the resistance. Some people do it by never speaking up. Other people do it by speaking up so much, they're seen as clowns and trolls. So they're ignored, mm -hmm. right? Some people are constantly just being a wise guy. Other people can't help but be selfish. Mm -hmm. It all adds up to hiding. And the opposite of hiding is to do something worth sharing to put your name on it, to own it, to be able to say, here, I made this. Because that's scary. That can get you kicked out of the village. Yeah. But the deal is we don't live in the village anymore and there are no saber-toothed tigers anymore. So you don't want to be, as Zig would say, a wandering generality. You want to be a meaningful specific. Or make sure you go find yourself the safest possible factory job. But as you can see, those are disappearing really fast. Yeah, absolutely. And that fear too, it's so in your head, like a few, well, 10 years ago, I was doing like a blog post a week. And the first one I did, that button was so heavy to push when I hit put the publish yeah. button, right? Like it was so scary. Like it was almost like someone's ready to fight me. And then yeah. I, you hit the button and you're like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? I was ready to go in and just delete it. Like, like five seconds after I got, I can't put that online. And then fast forward 24, 48 hours, I tell my mom and my wife, I, I put it on. I looked at it, right? So I, there was definitely one person that downloaded it. Then like 48 hours later, it had two. So, and I talked to my wife and my mom and they're both like, oh yeah, it was great. I saw it. And one of them were lying to me because only one of them, only one of them, only one of them downloaded it. <laughs> and I, I think I know which one's lying to me, but I'm not going to say it on air. But it's so funny. You're just going to get ignored. You're so scared. They're going to ignore you for the. It's it's more ignorant, not ignorance, but like you're going to get ignored more than something to be scared of, right? Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you a secret about my blog. I don't hit live publish. I used to, and it was always so stressful. So now it's publishing X number of hours in the future. That's easy because you can always go back and change it. Yep. But once you've got it in the queue, you forget. Mm -hmm. And so then it like squirts out there. It's fine. Yep. If you were doing a blog or a podcast, one thing I struggle with just personally is like, how many in the queue are you comfortable with? Like not saying given your number, but like, you don't want to just have one. Then you're like, I got to get something out. Like, is it two weeks, three weeks, a month? Like what, what's a good queue to have as a prof working professional? Like as a professional? 
I guess it depends on what you do for a living. If you work for the New York Times, I hope your queue is only 10 minutes long. Okay. Right? Because breaking news needs to be breaking news. Don't write a story that's going to come out in three months. Yeah. <laughs> um, I intentionally made my podcast timeless. That was on purpose. So I got 30 weeks ahead. Okay. Because if I was healthy, if I didn't have a sore throat, if I had some ideas, I'd make two or three in a day. Why not? Yep. Right? Perfect. And yep. But it all depends on what you are going to use as fuel. Mm -hmm. What is going to, to build for you the confidence you need to keep doing it? Yep. No, it makes sense. Right, let's move over to this one here. Right? This is marketing. I guess the takeaway of this book here, and I took the course. This is marketing. I, I took the course, which was the six-month course, which was awesome. The main thing I learned from that, two things. One, marketing is making change happen. Because if you market something and there's no impact or there's no change, it's you basically, it's not marketing. It's just, it just didn't happen. Tree falling in the woods. So you have to make an impact. You have to make change. And like the three questions I boiled this whole book down to is who's it for? What's it for? What change do you seek to make? And that is so powerful. You can fill in the gaps. But like anything I do, like if I create something or I add something, or I want to do something, I'm like, or who, who's this for? What do I want them to do? Like what change do I want to bring about? And that's just, just a great barometer. Is this something I should put my energy towards or not energy towards? Yeah, you got it. I have nothing to add. And then lastly, before we get into a quick Q&A, I took some questions from some of my listeners for you. This one here, just to me, change the game, the practice. This one, I, there would be no podcast without it i've been waiting for your daily reader like the like the page a day godin all right that's like, coming out next year is it really the page a day my friend michael invented the page a day calendar okay 30 40 years ago okay and and he reached out to me like he did the jeopardy one and all that. and he reached out to me and he said i think it's time you should have a page a day calendar i was like count me in Awesome. And I'm just basically dripping this. I read it a couple of times, 200 and some posts, just doing one a day, just one a day. And it keeps that creative juices flowing. But speaking about the practice, I think what distilled out of that is I used to think the muse or like Bob Dylan, if you listen to Bob Dylan, or you would think like Sylvester Stallone wrote Rocky in five hours or, or Bob Dylan wrote his, wrote a song in 20 minutes. It's that it's not the magic comes over you. You have to show up every day and you create the magic with the practice. Like where's your hour every right. day, right? You don't show up when it's convenient. You just show up. You don't show up when you have something to say. You have something to say because you showed up, right? Correct. Bingo. And I can't tell you how uncomfortable this makes some people because it puts them right back on the hook. Yeah. Show me your bad writing. Show me your 500 pages that you don't think are any good. Because I guarantee you, if you write 500 pages that are no good, one good page is going to sneak in there. And one good page is more than anyone will ever create. So good for you. One good page. Just one good page. And then that start, that's like the spark that starts it, right? Correct. And you have something to build, take away, add to it, right? And also to creativity. I used to think creativity was a talent or it's something you were born. Like I can jump high yeah. or, or yeah. I used to think like, I used to literally tell people early in my career, like, I'm not that creative. Like, I ah, don't ask me, I'm not creative, but realizing you sit down every day for 15, 20 minutes and write something, or, or I spend maybe a half hour a day on my podcast. Right. And then all of a sudden you have something creative to ship out at the end. What of the a coincidence. Day. Crazy. What a coincidence that creative people happen to put a lot of effort into it. Go figure. It, why do you think so many people think, well, I can't write music, I can't write poetry, I can't have a podcast or a YouTube channel, or write a blog, I'm not creative. Where do you think that comes from? Well, the indoctrination runs deep, right? So we say to any kid who's over six foot six, you should play basketball because we can't help but notice their height talent. They're born with height talent and therefore they should use it. We don't want to admit that we have creative talent because if we do, we have to be on the hook. If we're on the hook, we have to raise our hand. If we're on our hand, we might get thrown out of the village and get eaten by a tiger. So it's easier to pretend we weren't born with it. But when you were four, you told a joke and someone laughed. When you were six, you said something generous. When you were eight, you helped somebody who needed being helped. All of a sudden you stopped because you got brainwashed into thinking it wasn't your thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's nonsense. I think that leaders aren't people who are born to be leaders. They're people who choose to be leaders. Understood. That's great. And then in the book, I love the cover with these little blurbs in the cover, creativity, 
is an act of leadership. And I, that's the first time I've ever heard that where being creative, having the guts to put something out there, like here, I made this here. This is for definitely not for everybody, right? 99.9% .9 of the world will never even remotely want to even think about seeing it, but that zero, 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 zero point one percent that engages it, it's for them. And then you hope that they look for you on the regular to show up, right? Exactly. Cool. I want to do to be respectful of your time, switch over to some Q&A, some from me, right. some from the listeners and a couple noted guests that you may know. One, this one's from me. So what would you say, I hear this a lot, what would your advice be to someone who wants to express themselves creatively, but has no idea where to start? Like, uh, Seth, I have no idea what I'd write about. I have no idea what my YouTube channel would be on. Like, I want to have some creative pursuit, but I just don't know if I have the time and I have no idea what I'd talk about. I'd start with your dog. I'd start with the kid next door. I'd start with the crossing guard who can't run away because they have to stand on their corner every day, right? It doesn't matter where you start. Start with the smallest viable audience. It could be one person, two people, or write a blog under another name. Mm -hmm. Once you get up to 20 posts under somebody else's name, I'm betting you're going to want to change it to your name. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you get rid of the fear of reaching everyone, you're out of excuses. So you can find out. Yep. And how about someone doesn't know what to write about, like subject matter? How can someone dial in on like, what would my podcast be on? What would, I know I struggled with this podcast would be on for a couple of weeks in the course, but the course gets you through it really quick. The cuts where the cohort comes through. But what, what would you say? Someone's like, well, I have... who's it for and what's it for? Right. Mm -hmm. Like if, if this is just an experiment, I don't care if you make it about raising hybrid roses or making cherry wood canoe paddles. It doesn't matter if it's going to take a significant amount of your time. What's it for? Is yeah. it to earn your reputation? Is it to change the culture the way you want it to change? Is it to make you a living? Reverse engineer backwards. If mm -hmm. this was successful, what would that look like? And then say, well, what would have to happen for this to be successful? Oh, that's great. All right, next question. What would you say to someone who says, I have an idea. I think I figured out what I want to do. But deep down, I am a little like afraid of people will laugh at me. Nobody will listen or I'll just totally be ignored. What do you say to someone that's just afraid to put themselves out there and just have their ego crushed? Well, I would say congratulations because it means you're a human. People who aren't either aren't actually being creative or they're psychopaths. <laughs> that imposter syndrome is real because we're imposters. We're describing the future before it gets here. We are putting something into the world we can't be sure was correct. Mm -hmm. And you can fight it or you can use it as a signal, as a compass. If this makes you feel more like a fraud, it might be the very thing you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. You follow the fear basically, right? And I blogged for a while because I was just scared. I should do both, but I, I've got to figure out how to do both. I, I have to figure out how to walk and chew gum at the same time. But I stopped chewing gum. <laughs> now I'm walking with the podcast. And the podcast scared me. I did, like I got to the point after a couple hundred blog posts where like I was comfortable putting it out there and knew kind of knew what the results would be when I sent it out. And but podcasting scared the heck out of me. And then so I went yeah. that way. But so I, and now blogging scare me again because even though no one ever read my blog, I still think I can't write. Like, hey, I your write. mom read your blog. <laughs> That's right. I got a big audience. Okay, next question. Here are two things I know I personally struggle with, but I know a lot of people do as well. How do you know when your bad writing or bad podcasting ends and the good ideas to ship out begin? Like, how can you determine which shippable to which can be buried? Here's an example. I, when I would early days of my blog, I would write something and I thought it's the best thing I've ever wrote. And I would show it to my wife, who was my editor. And she said, this is awful. You can't post it. She would totally change it around. Like 99.9% .9 of the time she was right. And like my meter was broke. Like, how do you know where the good, end, your version of good ends, right? a good starts and bad ends? Is that a fair question? It's a totally fair question. So I don't know if you're a music fan, maybe you are. If oh, there's, yeah. a, there's a CD you can find of Billy Joel's first demos, or you can go uh, listen to the history of rock and roll in 500 songs. I'm listening to one, episode 153 right now. And you can hear some of the very first songs the Pink Floyd did back when they were called the Pink Floyd. And the key to both of them is they were terrible, 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 terrible. But if they hadn't published those, we never would have had the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So with all due respect to your wife, I think you publish the work and that makes you better. That makes the work better. It gives you discernment and then you do it again. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Appreciate it. 
All right, here is one of our celebrity guest questions. Uh, this is from Jay Papazan, co-author of The One Thing, who is a guest on the show, who will be in the new season right after I post yours. Here's Jay's big question. Seth, someone as creative as you, someone as creative as you has a bunch of ideas, an abundance of ideas. How do you choose which ones to work on and which ones to like hold off on? Okay, so the first thing is everyone is as creative as me. I just ship more stuff, but even then I don't ship that much stuff. If you have a lot of ideas, that's an example of resistance because we say, I can't possibly do anything because I got to work on all of these things. Or we work on too many things in public, sabotaging our ability to make an impact. And what I would say to you is get back to who's it for and what's it for, and then pick something. And the exercise that I think is really useful is this. Write up three of the kinds of things you could do. I could be a podcaster. I could do this. I could do that. Two pages describing mm -hmm. in detail what you would do. And then assemble a group of three people and say, I'm giving you three pages of things I might do. And I will abide by whichever one you pick. You pick, whatever you pick is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Just the act of getting ready to do that will keep you from doing it. Because you'll say, oh, I'm not letting them pick. I'm doing number two. Great, go do number two. The only reason you have number one and number three is to keep you paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Write up a business plan for each one and either force yourself to pick or have a, a council of people you trust pick. And then whatever they pick, you got to do. Yep. It reminds me a little bit of that Warren Buffett where you write like one through 10 what you need to do. Number one is your to-do list, two down, go to the trash. Then you focus on your one. Uh, last big question before we wrap it up. This one is from Derek Sivers, past guest on the show. Derek? Hey, Derek. Derek? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here's, here's, one. here's a good one. Derek, this is from Derek Sivers. I quote, Seth, could you please talk about Keith Jarrett's influence on your improvisation? Your podcast and live events are very improvised. Keith Jarrett's pure improvisation was astonishing and very scary to you at first. So is this a private joy of yours or a challenge of yourself? How do you know when to improvise chosen over extra preparation? Wow. Derek is one of the smartest people I know. Scary. Yeah. I was so scared to interview him. Oh my gosh. I, oh, I, when yeah. I interviewed him. I took a deep breath before I hit the record button. <laughs> He's brilliant. All right. So... Keith Jarrett. First of all, there's one thing that Keith Jarrett used to do that I have never done and never will. Keith Jarrett could tell if the audience wasn't with him. And the way he could tell is in the quiet parts, in the soft parts, and in the slow parts, sometimes people in the audience would cough. No one ever coughed during the bluesy, upbeat parts of his solo piano recitals. And he developed a bad habit of saying, well, if you're not here for me, I'm not here for you. And he would walk off the stage and not come back. So if you went to see him at Carnegie Hall, which I did a couple of times, there were these giant vats of Ricola. And they would, when you sat down, people would sit next to you and go, have you ever seen Keith before? And you'd say, no, say, get some cough drops. Don't cough. And the entire audience was always on high alert because they didn't want to let Keith down. That is key to the bond we're trying to make of saying, I'm here dancing. We're doing it together. Let's not let each other down. The second part of what Derek's talking about is when I get hired to give a speech, I used to say to people, do you want me to bring my new stuff or do you want me to bring the classics? And every time they would say, bring the classics. Because the person who's hiring you wants you to play your greatest hits, right? So you know, the same thing is true for Prince or Stevie Wonder or anybody in between. That if you go to a wedding, the wedding band is just going to play Stevie Wonder's eight big hits. They're not going to play some obscure thing from one of his early records. The problem is, if you do that all the time, you become a cover band of yourself. And what I tried to build into my work is a discipline of saying, I am going to show up in this part of our production. And sometimes it was seven hours. I would do seven hours of improv without a plan, without knowing where it was going to lead, just to be fully present. And then there are other times when you have to show up and quote yourself. 
because that's what the audience needs. That's what the audience was promised. That's what you can sustain. Mm -hmm. And now I'm 62. There's no question when I was 45, I could do seven hours of improv. I don't think I can do seven hours of improv. I appreciate that. Derek, I hope that answers your question. Steve. Wrapping up here, Seth, we spoke about a lot. If you could have everyone listening take just one lesson away from everything we discussed over the last 45 minutes, what would that lesson be? Well, I want to say two things. The first one is a direct answer to your question, which is, there's a system, it's all around us. We're just goldfish, but it helps to see the water. That your version of the world around us has been informed by the way you've been indoctrinated. And if it's not working for you, it might take a couple minutes, but it's worth taking a look to figure out how it might actually be working. The second thing I would say is not what we talked about, which is there's someone around you who is lonely or disrespected, who is undervalued, who is in pain, who needs to be seen and understood. And if you just spend five extra minutes to do that, it would really make a big difference. Wow, that's awesome. Seth, as you look out to 2023, what's the most exciting project you're working on now? Well, I spent the last year building uh, the Carbon Almanac, which has been yeah. translated into multiple languages. The world is starting to wake up and see that we have to do something about climate. And yeah. I'm hoping that fusion is right around the corner. Who knows? But yeah. um, I think that we are watching the industrial mindset be dismantled right before our eyes. And some people like you are showing up and saying, let me talk about what it means to be human. And if we get more people to do that and to contribute and to take responsibility, I think that would be a good thing. Awesome. Those daily email, emails are great. Uh, your blog post is amazing, but that those daily, uh, do you write those or how does, uh, or is it? I did not on purpose. I did okay. not write the climate okay. uh, things. We are 1900 people in 91 countries and it is not a Seth Godin project. I am just part of it. Gotcha. Understood. It's fantastic though. The book's great. Appreciate, appreciate doing that. And I think it's slowly turning the tide. I think it's slowly getting to where it needs to be. How about two fun questions to wrap up, Seth? One, Seth Godin, if you could spend the day with anyone, historical figure, alive or dead, who would you spend the day with? My parents. Awesome. And we, we started this talking about that dinner table at 10, 12 years old. If you could go back to that dinner table at 10, 12 years old with your two sisters and your parents, what would you want to say to them? You know... It's very tempting to want to rewrite history and all the speed bumps or the things unsaid, but then I wouldn't be me mm -hmm. and it worked out okay, all of it. So um, sure, there are hallmark things that I would love to say to lots of people in my life who I never took the time to say, but instead I use that to inform what I'm going to say to people tomorrow. And I hope we can realize we don't get tomorrow over again. We get to do it once, so we might as well do it better. Awesome. I will, I'm going to end with a quick footprints. I think it was a gift <laughs> of the marketing program. I'm going to end with one of my favorite openings to any book, and I'll just tie this up here. This first page, and I quote, Seth Godot, I'll paraphrase, be respectful of your time. The setting was right out of a movie. Standing next to the campfire was Neil Armstrong. He told us the story of the Apollo mission a full moon began to rise in the clouds behind him. Casually, he looked over his shoulder at the moon and said, I've been there. That sets the bar pretty high. Seth, I would like to thank you for setting the bar extremely high. I'd like to thank you for your work. Thank you for the blog, the ideas, the course, just turning the lights on for so many people and illuminating the path in front of you. I appreciate you. And uh, there's a whole lot of respect and admiration, man. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Joe. Keep leading. Keep making a ruckus. It matters. Oh, awesome. Seth, if people are looking for you online, where, where, where can they find you? You go to Seth's.blog or Seth's.store or just type Seth into your favorite search engine. I'm not that hard to find. Yeah, Seth Godin. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. This is awesome. Oh, Joe, you nailed it. Top 10. I really appreciate the help. Thank oh, you. Thank, thank you. you. I learned from you. You and Alex. My gosh, you and Alex are amazing <laughs> teachers. I couldn't do any of this before for the pod seven. So I, I appreciate you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. A pleasure.